to see uh, Aladdin Wainwright III here again, wasn't it? Yes, it was nice yeah. to see him, and it was nice to uh, see Great his father back Very, very, very peppy. Yeah. And, you know, only one of those guys behind him was actually in the band. <laughs> that guy in the tie just got off a bus and came up. Is that right? Yeah. Well, you see? <laughs> he That's the kind of music he yeah, Sure, I had to do a little shakedown on him. Our next guest has uh, created some of the most disturbing and depraved characters in fiction. <laughs> this is his latest uh, offering. It's called The Thief of Always. It's a book for children. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Clive Barker. Clive! <laughs> Happy, happy New Year to you, sir. Thank you. Now, here in the introduction, we mentioned that you had created some of the most disturbing and depraved characters in fiction. Like whom? Like what? Well, Pinhead from the Hellraiser movies. Uh, uh, yeah. The Pinhead. same people that applauded Grub Larva. Uh, that was a great shot, by the way. A great <laughs> thank shot. You. Oh, thank you. Um, and uh, I guess Candyman recently. Uh -huh. Yes. That was a big hit, wasn't that it? That did very well for us. Yeah. 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 We're on to Candyman too. That's in the in the works. So you are now. Do you consider yourself an author, a screenwriter, or I guess both? A little right? of both. Yeah. A little of both. Yeah. Tell me about the the Thief of Always. This is it says it right here on the cover. Mm -hmm. A fable. It's mm -hmm. it's uh, it's for kids more or less, right? It's for kids and adults. It's for the pissed off ten year old in anybody. Yes. <laughs> uh, and it's a, it's a horror story. Uh, very loosely. It's a very dark tale. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's got some scary parts, but I think Disney movies have got scary mm -hmm. parts. I mean, I remember the first time I was ever scared was in Pinocchio at the age of six. Uh, so that's right, they, they all end up in a, in a, in in a, Pleasure a, Island, in a whale's stomach or something. Oh, right? that's even worse. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, all of that cannibalistic <laughs> you stuff. Know, Pleasure Island don't sound that bad to me. <laughs> Long as Penelope's there, right? Yeah. Oh. Um, tell, tell us about about your about your childhood. Did uh, you enjoyed being frightened as a kid? Obviously. I, I, enjo I enjoyed frightening as a kid. Yeah. I mean, I could always do that very well. I mean, I was a lousy Boy Scout, but at 11 o'clock when the fires had burned low, I could always scare the hell out of the other kids. Uh -huh. uh, and I was always very proud of that. You know, it was the only thing I could do. I was short-sighted and fat, so what else was I going to do? Um, what was your family life like? What were your folks like? You have brothers very, and sisters? Very normal, very normal group of people. My mom worked in the school. My father worked in Liverpool on the docks. And I, actually, I had an interviewer at my house uh, just a few weeks ago. My mom and dad were there, and they said, so, uh, the interviewer said, so, you know, what did you think of your kid, you know, 10? And I just thought I'd had this normal childhood. Yes. And they said, uh, boy, he was crazy. Uh, he was completely, uh, <laughs> we wanted to send into an analyst. He was totally crazy. It's very reassuring. We wanted to go on vacation without, without him. Without him, exactly right. They had another 10 reasons, though, you know. Uh, when, when you do this kind of, uh, and forgive my ignorance on the topic, but when you do this kind of work, uh, is there research involved, or does it just all come from oh, no, this, somewhere? There's research. Yeah. Um, uh, a little while ago, I was at Sunday lunch in England, and a pathologist, a mortician, said to me, do you want to come to an autopsy? And I said, uh, yes, you know. <laughs> uh, this, is, this, is my, this is my job. I, I have yeah. to go. And uh, you, you learn extraordinary things. Like, for instance, they, they'd already sawn the top of the guy's head off. They take out his brain, and your brain, your brain's under pressure, you know. Or and mine is. Yeah. yeah. These, these days, my brain <laughs> under a lot of pressure. Let's talk about that. Um, and the brain is under pressure. It is expanded, and 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 uh, you can't get it back into the into the into the skull after it's been taken out to be examined. Did yeah, Did you try running cold water on it? No, I didn't. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Usually, <laughs> <It's really laughs> I think. <laughs> so that's I what think happens. I read that in Heloise once. That <laughs> so this guy says to me, he says, do you want to do you want to sew the top of the guy's head back on? And they use this blanket stitch, you know, that's, that that sort of folds the two raw edges of oh. the skin back in, so it's sort of so that you know it, it looks good yeah, when yeah, when it's sitting in the nice coffin. tidy seam, nice tidy <laughs> seam for the relatives. So I said, you know, I have to I have to do this. So I'm sewing away there, and very intent on this, and feeling, I think, pretty good, because I'm a horror writer. Hey, I could do this, yes. you know. And they didn't tell me that, that this procedure puts the skin of the forehead under pressure. So I'm sewing away, yeah, you got it already, and, and the cadaver's eyes, like, flicker open. <laughs> 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 <And> I, <laughs> oh, 
five. And I am, I am clinging to the ceiling, you yeah. know. And, and the morticians are like, yuck, yuck, you know. We always do this with you rookies, you know. Oh, my God. For, for a second, were you thinking that the guy maybe wasn't dead, but perhaps just well, too much no, will or something? Well, <laughs> man, he's just, he's I, coming he was, back. He was pissed off because his brain was in his stomach, you know. They take me that and Ooh. put it away. Yeah. Wow. Ooh, and you survived the experience. And wrote about it. Mm, yeah. Good for you. <laughs> uh, and uh, how is this doing? Do, do you get feedback from kids, or do, do yeah. kids buy it? Do parents buy it and read it to kids? Parents, or give it to kids? parents buy it for kids, and, and I'm also having kids signing up at the signings, and that's great. I think uh, it's important to start kids with imaginative stuff young. I mean, I think our imaginations need stimulation, and I think you should start as young as possible. Speaking of stimulation, how, how, do, you, how do you like living in uh, Los Angeles? Now? Oh, it's wonderful. It's a gas. I mean, I, I moved from London. I've been in London, I guess, 10 years. I'd expected California to be full of, you know, tanned, perfect bodies and so on. What I discover is it's my kind of city. It's full of grotesques, <laughs> you know? Uh, it is, I swear. Uh, there, are, there are little wealthy widows driving around my neighborhood, wizened by the sun. They're tiny yeah. little creatures, you know. They've tanned over all their diseases. They're, they're, like, they're like behind the wheels of their Cadillacs. You can barely see them. There are, there are women, vampire women, you know, pale skins, all dressed in black. And they've got this great thing now called roid rage. Have you heard one? No, not roid. Roid rage. It is a condition that muscle builders get into when they can't get the steroids. And it's a kind of mindless, as if muscle men weren't mindless enough, but mind, mindless rage. And they slam their heads against the, you know, the, the weightlifting machines and so on. <laughs> and I'm waiting I, at my gym. I'm waiting for one of these guys to let loose. <laughs> Help him put his brain back into his head. Put his brain yeah. back in, right. Uh, the, the, this is the, the newest work, eh? This is the newest it's work. It's called The uh, Thief of Always. It's a, a fable, and uh, for young and old alike. Clive, good to meet you. A pleasure. Have a great Thanks, 93. Thank you. Yeah, boy. Yes, sir. Tabitha, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you, and, and Happy New Year, and congratulations on Thank everything. You. Now, Paul plays Fleetwood Mac here, because they're, they're getting back together for the inauguration. They are. But aren't Fleetwood Mac always getting back together? No, actually. Haven't they done, like, six reunion albums? It's hard for them to get back together, because they're always in and out of rehab a lot. Hey! Hey, hey, hey. Oh, yeah. But What's... Stevie Nicks is actually one of my all-time favorite well, good. female singers. Good so. for you. Good right. for her. Good for all of us. Yeah. But let's, let's uh, before we before we give you your Dalmatian, let's let's talk a little bit. Take one home. Yeah, take two or take a dozen home. Hey, uh, you're a very young woman. Where are you from? Tell us a little bit about your background. Well, I am not from any one place because my dad's in the Air Force. I've lived all over the world. Uh -huh. Germany. I lived in the Philippines actually. Where were you born? Texas, uh -huh. San Antonio. Right. But the going overseas, I think, was more interesting the philippines I, I moved there i think when i was about 10 and we had just moved there from las vegas which was also an interesting place which did you prefer more uh, the philippines or las vegas um well the philippines had very interesting eating habits when i went over there outside my house often under the street light filipinos would catch flying rice bugs to eat wow flying rice bugs and as a 10-year-old, when you're pretty squeamish about everything in general, that was quite a cultural this, shock. This is a product Uncle Ben was testing for a while, isn't it? <laughs> but it's, it's actually supposed to be quite a delicacy, but I never had the guts to try Oh, it. my. And Las Vegas, do you remember? You know, Las Vegas is, is a beautiful community. I mean, uh, the casino gambling and, and the naked babes notwithstanding. It's... <laughs> The, the desert and the surrounding areas are spectacular, and it's a very, very high quality of life for people who live there. If you like bars on your windows, yeah. Now, what do you mean by that? Well, it's, it's very, um, I think gambling can be very corrupt. Yeah. You know, it's a big mafia town, uh, probably. Not exactly a bullet in there, is it? Yeah, well, you know, I mean, it's dangerous. You, we, had, we had people at night running through our yards, sometimes with police chasing after them. Everyone slept during the day, so you weren't, as a kid, you weren't allowed to make a lot of noise. I remember neighbors getting up and yelling. Are you sure they weren't they just were playing Kino. outdoor Kino? <laughs> they could have been. You're right. Uh, so, so how did you get the job of being the political correspondent for MTV after your peripatetic, uh, peripatetic early upbringing? Well, I interned a lot for free around New York. I went to NYU. So while I was in college, 
I slaved and during the day I'd work at World News Tonight or CNN and I it was sort of odd though because I had to make a living as well and you didn't get paid for internships so I changed out of my business suit into a genie costume I worked as a cocktail waitress and we had to dress up the whole Barbara Eden thing and uh, this was uh, here in New York City? at a club yeah. in Times Square actually yes and you made a lot of money but the downside was that um, you had a lot of celebrities there because it was Times Square and people like Michael Bolton <laughs> following you around and drinking really? super. Yeah. <laughs> wow, Michael Bolton was there? Yeah. Uh, sort of in between his first album and his comeback. Yeah. Uh, but so anyway, even from that, then uh, with your internships, you suddenly are hired by MTV. What was that process like? How did you get that job? Well, MTV was one of the places that I worked while I was in college. I used to write the heavy metal show after I would work at World News Tonight, yeah. so that was big. And I went up, after I graduated, I went to Vermont and became a political correspondent at a little dinky station and then came back to New York and yeah. they were looking for a woman to put on the air. What, what I'm trying to establish here is you have been very, very successful uh, very, very early in your life, which is, is great. Not, not many people have that kind of uh, success story early I've been on. lucky. And then the Today Show. The Today Show. What do you do for the Today Show? I do a monthly report on anything. It could be the new administration, could be, you know, cultural topics. Um, I'm doing stuff for the inaugural book for the inauguration for them and MTV is actually also having an inaugural ball where and Vogue is doing a duet with a newly signed R&B singer named Roger Clinton. Oh, yeah, the, the president's Bill's brother. brother. Now yeah. is that going to be trouble in your estimation the way the way Billy Carter was trouble for for Jimmy Carter and, and the rest? Is it it's, it kind of got that same sort of feel to it, doesn't it? Like it something could go it's wrong sort of here. Deja vu. I don't know. It, it, that's a good point. What uh, uh, But what? the Today show every everything seems pretty good with that so far. So far, so good. Yeah. Got any pointers at w about working in Don't NBC? share a locker with Willard. <laughs> uh, tell us about uh, the 11-month, the uh, your campaign experiences. Uh, c compare for us a little bit your experiences with uh, President-elect Clinton and also uh, the incumbent George Bush. Wow. Um, Clinton, I think, d made a lot of attempts, like a lot of the other candidates, to seem hip on MTV. And he was very friendly to us and really was counting on young people to elect him, I think. Mm -hmm. So he, he, out, he made a big outreach to MTV. And one time when we were on the bus uh, going to Albany, Georgia, he started singing Ahab, the Arab. Mm -hmm. You guys know that song? Yeah. <laughs> Ray Stevens, because we, we ran in, we went, Albany, Georgia is the hometown of Ray Stevens. Mm -hmm. So he started singing this. And then Gore joined in, and I was just sitting back sort of, you know, looking at them like these could these people could be running our country. <laughs> Here they are seeing this. And now they will be. Yeah. And now they are. Yeah. Bush, on the other hand, was not as uh, he didn't really want to go on MTV. He was pretty reluctant. And once we finally got him on a train to interview him for ten minutes, uh, he seemed like he would rather be any other place in the whole world. So. Are you feeling that way here tonight? No. <laughs> Good. I'm a little nervous. All right, well, don't no, please, by all means, don't, 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 don't be nervous. Well, uh, everything's fine. I'm very new at this. Well, this is, is hey, so am I. <laughs> uh, I tell you what, we need to do a commercial, and when we come back, who knows what the hell's going to happen? <laughs> poor judgment. It, I think it demonstrates on a very, very insignificant scale. Demonstrates poor judgment. Don't you think? Sure. Bit, no. I didn't know that you had the A-Rebs. Well, no. How would you? I mean, the song is like 40 years old or something. Harry Truman singing Ahab the Ahab. Now that, that would have made better sense. But they uh, knew the words. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, our vice president and president know the words to Ahab the Ahab. <laughs> Learn something new every day. Uh, Tabitha, nice to see you and uh, continued success. You have a, a wonderful start to, I'm Thank sure, you. what will be a very long and successful, happy career for you. Thank you. Yeah, good to meet you. Uh, <laughs> my thanks also to uh, Chaka Khan and uh, Michael McKean. Uh, Money on the program, Mary Stewart Masterson.